Brighton District City Councilor. Today is Thursday, April 25th, and we are here with our good friends from Boston Public Schools regarding uh, review of school, uh, BPS school budgets as part of dockets 0622 through 0625. Orders for the FY20 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, appropriation for other post-employment benefits, and appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements. Dockets 0626 through 0628, capital budget appropriations including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. I'd like to remind folks in the chamber that uh, this hearing is being uh, broadcast live and recorded for uh, future review on Com Comcast Channel 8, RCN 82, Verizon 1964, and streamed at boston.gov backslash city dash council dash TV. I'd ask people in the chamber also to silence their electronic devices. Uh, we will take public testimony at various points of hearings, uh, and we ask that folks who wish to testify sign up uh, with the, to the, on the sheet at the front door. Please state your name, any affiliation, and residence, and mark the box yes if you wish to testify. This budget review will encompass around 34 hearings over roughly six more weeks. We strongly encourage residents, whether here in the chamber or at home, to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. This can be done in several ways. Come to one of the hearings and give public testimony live. Come to the hearing dedicated to public testimony on Tuesday, June 4th, anytime from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. We will be here for at least that time frame and we'll stay as long as we need to to hear from everyone who would like to speak on the budget. You can send your testimony to the Committee on Ways and Means uh, at City Council, fifth floor, Boston City Hall, Boston Mass, 02201, or email the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. I will um, introduce my colleagues in order of their arrival. To my immediate left is Councilor at Large Anissa Asabi George and the Ed Chair. And to my far left is Councilor Ed Flynn, and Councilor Campbell seems to have just stepped out for a moment. Uh, as I said, I'm going to uh, call a couple of folks to testify before your presentation. I'd like to bring up um, Nailene Rivera and Abel Fuentes. And there's, um, you can speak right there at that podium where the laptop is. Do we speak together or one at a time? Oh, do we just dive right in? Okay. Um, I'm Nailene Rivera. I want to try to speak. Bring the, the see the uh, microphone thing? Yeah. yeah. Bring it up to you as far up. Thanks. Oh, it moves. Okay. I'm Nailene Rivera. I go to East Boston High School, and I'm here to support my school. I know that some of the teachers that are being cut were some of my favorite teachers. And as a student athlete and vice president in many clubs, I support my school and care about it very much. And I wouldn't want to see any of my teachers leave, so. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mabel Fuentes, and I'm also a senior at East Boston High. And um, uh, I, look at, I look at my teachers not only as people who come and teach, but as a family, because they change many people's lives. And I would feel really like, I don't know, like I would, I would just feel bad because poverty now is because it, poverty is just making life very difficult for children uh, because, you know, some children, like, you know, are having problems at home. They don't get enough sleep, uh, not enough breakfast, uh, and I feel like this needs to change. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Yep. Appreciate it. Okay, now with that, we've just been joined by uh, District Seven. 7, sorry, <laughs> City Councilor Kim Janey. Thanks, Kim. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Eleanor for your presentation. Thank you, Councillor. 
I am going to start with a very brief few minutes to recap our FY20 proposal. I know we have some new members of the audience and for folks at home. And then I'll turn it over to David Bloom, our budget director, to walk through more details on how we fund schools. And then my colleagues from our Office of Human Capital, Saran, 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 Saran Daly and Emily Kozelbosch, will be presenting on our efforts with human capital. Um, thank you, David. A few key facts and figures that summarize the FY20 budget proposal. The proposal includes a $26 million increase, which will bring our total general fund operating budget to $1.139 billion. I want to emphasize critically that this does not include any increases in teacher salaries as we're still in active negotiations with the Boston Teachers Union. As our contract with the Teachers Union represents almost $600 million, we can expect a substantial further increase when the contract is settled. In addition, the $15 million an announcement and investment in UPK by the mayor is on top of and outside of the BPS budget. In total, since FY14, in the last six years, we've had a 25% increase in per pupil spending, and we're now at over $20,600 per pupil. We appreciate the support of the city for education as the city continues to make up for stagnant state and federal funding. With the $26 million increase, in addition to covering some increasing costs outside of our collective bargaining contract with the teachers, we're also making a series of proposed investments, notably $6 million that we believe will continue to support equity and stability in our schools, as well as a series of um, investments that sit on central budgets. I walked through slide four with this body on Tuesday. Again, I'm going to briefly summarize to provide context to what David walks us through. We think of the BPS budget in four major categories. The first are the direct school expenses. These are the dollars that prim primarily sit on school budgets. And David's going to walk us through today how we decide uh, to take the funds we have and divide them as equitably and transparently as possible. Those are not the only funds and resources that go to schools, however. We have a series of important resources that serve students in schools every day, but they happen to sit on central line items. We call those school services budgeted centrally. Those two categories of spend are 89% of total spending in BPS. Our central administration, which will be the topic of a hearing this afternoon, is approximately 5.4%, and then we also spend 5.3% on services to non-BPS students, a combination of state mandates and investments the city has elected to make. With that, I'll hand it over to David Bloom, our budget director. Uh, good David, afternoon. can I just interrupt yeah. for of one course. minute? Um, I'd like to also recognize that we've been joined by Councilor Michael Flaherty and Councillor Tim McCarthy, and I do want to read into a, uh, the record um, from one of our colleagues. Uh, Councillor Siomo, I regret to inform you that I, I will be missing today's hearing on the City Council's Ways and Means Docket 0622-0628 FY20 budget, BPS school budgets on Thursday, April 25th at noon. Uh, I will review the hearing online and please read this into to the rec record. Sincerely, Matt O'Malley. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Take it away. So as, as we um, talk about our school funding today, um, we thought we'd start by sharing our four main priorities for how we're funding schools. Um, those four are equity, transparency, stability, and school flexibility. Um, this slide highlights our investments made across those areas, both in uh, the current school year that we are committed to maintaining and additional new investments in the upcoming school year. Uh, in addition, as Eleanor mentioned, over the last six years, uh, per pupil spending has increased over 25%, with school budgets growing slightly faster than that, uh, than overall spending. Um, and as we discussed on Tuesday, this has led to an increase in uh, classroom-based teaching staff um, and uh, both in the total number of staff but also uh, in staff per 100 students. 
So I want to walk through some new information on a summary of school-based decisions. As you may recall, um, we allocate funds out to schools through a process called weighted student funding. And then school communities make decisions on how that funding is going to be spent. So over the past six years, as we've mentioned, teaching staff has risen by uh, proposed or 388 FTE. Uh, between F19 and, uh, 19 and 20, uh, we expect that number to be 70, uh, 14 teachers and 56 paras. Uh, but those numbers will increase as we have funds in reserve to respond to changes in enrollment that will be allocated over the course of the spring, summer, and fall. Um, as uh, you also may be aware, we are expanding inclusive practices throughout the district. Um, and as a result, the number of general education teachers is declining, while the number of our school budgeted special education teachers is, uh, and paras are rising 90 FTE. And um, there's also centrally budgeted school-based FTE that rise another 25 in that special education world. Overall, this represents a 3% increase in special education budget. Um, in addition, there's a 5% increase in teachers teaching either SEI or ESL our two primary methods of serving students who are English learners. That's over 36 FTE, all of this before our reserves are liquidated. As I mentioned, weighted student funding is our main method of distributing funds to schools, and I'll go over that in a moment. But I also just wanted to highlight some other methods of distributing funds to schools. We have certain special program schools that due to their complexity um, do not receive weighted student funding, and their funding is essentially flat with some small adjustments. Uh, we also have Title I and special education IDEA funding that goes out uh, to schools and that's also basically flat. Um, then there's a series of standard allocations we make into school budgets where we're adding a position to a school, uh, things like a nurse or our special education coordinators. There are also rules-based, uh, what we call soft landings and sustainability allocations. Uh, given out to schools experiencing declining enrollment or suffering with low performance, as well with um, schools just struggling to fund all the basic essentials. Um, there are then some additional adjustments, a list of which is in the footnotes for other sorts of programs, as well as expanded learning time and benefits. Um, but the main method is weighted student funding. Uh, this was approved by school committee in 2011 as the main mechanism to distribute the amount of money we have. In this very simplified overview, and there's a lot more available online, essentially the idea is that there's a certain amount of dollar per pupil by need, right? So that if a student goes to a different school with the same amount of need, they're getting the same amount of funding, but students with higher needs get more funding. That's multiplied by the expected number of students to give you um, the, the total amount allocated to the school. Uh, some examples of what those weights are are on slide 14. Um, there are uh, base instructional weights for the teachers and classroom paras that every type of classroom requires as driven by the way we staff those classrooms and the class size ratios. But there are also uh, some additional weights for things like poverty um, or some money that was allocated through the opportunity index that gives schools discretionary funds that they can um, choose how best to use in their school community. Um, I mentioned there's a lot more detail than what I'm providing in this presentation. If you go to bostonpublicschools.org slash budget, you'll see these four documents. What they do is the top two show you for each school, both how did they get their weighted student funding total and how do all of the different things beyond weighted student funding total up to their total budget. And then on the bottom, there's summary information available for all schools if you want to look across schools. But both, both things are available for all schools. Um, finally, we know a particular topic of concern and interest is supporting schools with enrollment changes. Um, we know uh, that uh, enrollment is one of the primary factors in a way student funding system of how school budgets change. Um, currently, our base amount in weighted student funding has stayed the same due to the absence of the BTU agreement. That will increase when we have a new agreement with higher salaries. 76 of our schools came into this year with projected decreased enrollment. Um, 
but th through our mechanisms that were in place to try and help those schools adjust, both through additional investment and soft landing, 37 of those 76 schools were able to see increasing overall budget despite declining enrollment. There are five schools where, uh, in addition to those 37, new investment was able to allow for increased staffing despite perhaps a not increasing overall budget. At nine schools, essentially, their budget's not increasing, but it's essentially flat within one FTE. And then there are 25 schools losing at least one FTE. The median staffing change in that group was about 2.3 FTE, and the median enrollment decrease is 31 students. Many of these schools are getting the $1.3 million pot of money we have available to support uh, low-performing schools with enrollment issues. Um, it doesn't turn them around to gain any money, but it helps soften uh, the blow. Um, and there is an additional investment of $750,000 towards low-performing schools that has not yet been allocated. Uh, finally, I mentioned reserves. We do not have general purpose reserves in the Boston Public Schools. We have a series of reserves for very specific purposes. They are laid out here. Um, the primary ones, the largest ones you'll see here, there's a reserve for um, staff costs, uh, but there's also then a reserve for weighted student funding. And that money goes out to schools over the course of spring and uh, summer and fall as we see the enrollment rounds come in and we see schools that might have higher enrollment than uh, we had projected. We have money in reserve to give out to those schools, allocate them additional staff, additional funding um, to help them with the additional students. And we expect that every year that amount ends at zero uh, through by the middle of the year. Uh, there is more, a lot of more information online. Once again, we have this new interactive web tool to help explore our budget and the four documents I mentioned, as well as all of the documents we presented to school committee at Boston Public Schools forward slash budget. You can also email budget at bostonpublicschools.org with any questions or concerns. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Office of Human Capital for their information. Um, good afternoon. My name is Emily Calais Kuzelbush, and I am the Chief Human Capital Officer in the Boston Public Schools. I am joined today by Saren Daly, the Managing Director of Recruitment, Cultivation, and Diversity Programs, and multiple members of our team um, here in the chamber. Given today's focus on school budget budgets, it is appropriate that we focus on the people in those schools. As we just heard from the two students who testified from East Boston High School, we must focus our resources on ensuring that we have the educators, leaders, and employees that will empower each child in our system with excellent educational opportunities. Um, as you've seen over the past five years, we think about our work in three main categories, cultivating and recruiting educators, hiring educators, and then developing and retaining them. Within that work, I'm going to talk for a very brief time specifically about how we're recruiting and preparing the teachers that our students need, providing differentiated support to our schools, and developing our leaders and leadership teams. Today, I'd like to highlight three key areas of investment in progress in our office. First, in our work to ensure that our students have excellent teachers who reflect the rich diversity of our student body, We've identified the state's teacher licensure exam as a major obstacle for many of our teachers of color. Over the past year, we have refined and expanded our support for educators to support the Massachusetts, excuse me, to pass the Massachusetts test for educational licensure, also known as the MTEL. Our program has empowered BPS's educators of color to pass the state test at two to three times the statewide pass rate and has enabled BPS to retain a higher number of these educators. Second, we've invested in a position to lead our portfolio of retention programs and to work directly with our educators of color. These programs are designed to directly address the needs of our educators of color who are in our system. Finally, we're excited to announce an innovative two-year partnership with City Year in which individuals will spend a year working in BPS schools and then earn funding for their masters in teaching. We are excited about this pathway into the teaching profession. Each of these investments is a specific effort to identify, cultivate, and retain the educators that our students need. 
Over the past few years, the offices of human capital, equity, and academic superintendents have worked in collaboration to provide additional workforce diversity supports to 15 to 20 schools per year. These schools are identified by meeting two criteria, the number of positions that they had to fill and staff diversity levels that are below 35% educators of color. Last year, the candidates hired at these 15 schools who self-identify as educators of color increased by 4%, from 41% to 45%, in line with the district's overall hiring percentages. This is the first year that there has been no gap between the hiring done by these lower diversity schools and the overall district. In addition, last year, in line with the shift in the district's strategy to differentiate support to low-performing schools, our office focused supports in nine low-performing schools. These nine schools filled 120 vacancy, which is about vacancies, which is about 10% of the total vacancies in the district, and did 81% of that by June 1st, demonstrating that the effectiveness that additional support can have in our schools. These high-touch supports and the measurable outcomes help us to understand what the most effective and high-leverage interventions are that we can provide as a central office to best support school-based hiring. We are also focusing on continuing to improve how we support schools in managing their staff and also how we hold them accountable. This year, we're, bu we're building on the partnership with the offices of equity, academic superintendents, and Achievement Gap by having schools set school-based diversity hiring goals. This is the first year that this level of accountability is moving to the school level for every single school since it's incorporated into school leader evaluations. Our office is also focusing this year on better supporting school leaders so that they can in turn achieve remarkable outcomes for students, build effective teams, and manage teachers and staff. To do so, we continue to partner with local and national experts, including the Lynch Leadership Academy and the University of Virginia School Turnaround Program. Finally, to support school leaders with their challenging jobs, we are also investing in helping them build their leadership teams. Those are the assistant principals, directors of instructions, or teacher leaders who uh, work alongside them as they lead the school. This year, we're working to provide the maximum flexibility for schools to build, recruit, and select the best individuals for their leadership teams in line with our overall district priority of, of supporting schools. We have always focused on ensuring our students have educators who represent their own racial, cultural, and linguistic diversity. You can click, thanks. As I know this council has cited before, the research behind the importance of role models and culturally responsive teaching only continues to grow. A recent paper by the Institute of Labor Economics found that having just one black teacher in third, fourth, or fifth grade reduced low-income black boys' probability of dropping out of high school by 39%. This research, as well as what we hear from our students, our teachers, and our school leaders themselves, fuels our work. <coughs> as you can see on this graph, overall, the percentage of hires who self-report as black, Latinx, or Asian has increased from 39% in 2014 to nearly 46% this year. This year, while it's still a deep area um, in which we as a district need to improve, we saw particularly strong outcomes for our Latinx hires. Overall, the percentage of hires who report as Latinx increased from 11.8% to 13.5%. We have seen a 45% increase in the number of candidates who identify as Latinx since, since 2014. This is an increase from 331 candidates in 2014 to 479 last year. The combination of having more Latinx candidates and the interventions that we put in place helped translate into the 2% increase in Latinx hires this past year and a 7% increase in overall educators over the past five years. Again, this is still an area of focus and we are not satisfied with these results, but we are moving in the right direction. These specific interventions and others um, that I've described today have led to small but real improvements in our workforce diversity. After losing ground in 2016, uh, we recovered in 2017 and then improved a percentage point in our overall workforce demographics to 38.8% of educators who I'd identify as people of color this year. The Office of Human Capital has a few key components to our budget. 
Our general fund operating budget for FY19 uh, was $4.91 million, and the proposed budget next year is $4.96 million. Uh, the investments listed on the slide are primarily funded through Title I and Title II grants. Um, and I'm happy as we um, get into the discussion and I hear your questions to answer anything else you would like to know about either the budget or the programs or outcomes that I've described. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emily. And uh, we've been joined by Councilors Frank Baker and Councilor Lydia Edwards. Um, so the weighted student for me, can you... Um, um, detail any changes from last year to this year and is that kind of a consistent every year you readjust and how how, how do you um, come up with the adjustments I guess the philosophy behind WSF remains the same but we've made important changes the philosophy behind it is we think in a sea of imperfect ways to divvy up the money we have it's the best one we have we believe it is most equitable and most transparent to use um, something like WSF to allocate money to schools as opposed to old models where the central office, frankly, had too much power to allocate staff to schools and there was too much incentive for the loudest voices to get the most. Having said that, we have heard loud and clear concerns from the community for the last couple of years. What happens with a school with declining enrollment? Why can't we have a full-time nurse or librarian in every school. We haven't made it perfect, but I think we're making real change each year. Last year, we um, instituted a host of changes to try to increase stability for schools, and we doubled down on that strategy this year. So the biggest change for this year was that the district is now fully absorbing the first 2% decline in any school budget. And David and I are gonna be convening a work group this summer with school leaders to get input on even more changes we should make last year. So um, in summary, our philosophy of trying to be equitable and transparent remains, but we are really trying to listen and adjust. And there are um, some changes year over year. Did you wanna add anything, David? The only thing I would add in specific is um, that one of our goals is that, the, that we are not um, decreasing the amount of per pupil funding in each of the individual weights, right, that we're able to uh, work with our city team. And then, so then this year, uh, we actually did increase the amount of funding going through one of the weights. Um, and as I had mentioned, there are sort of two types. There's the core instructional and then the school discretionary. We increased uh, a weight for school discretionary funds through the opportunity index. We sometimes refer to it as school support funds. These funds go to about 100 schools in weighted student funding um, and are available. They're not tied to any one part of their budget. The school community gets to decide how they're spending it. Um, we allocated about an additional $3 million through that this year. Right, I was just looking at slide 14, right, where, so those uh, weights that are depicted in that graph to the bottom right, poverty, poverty, yep. um, what's poverty, C-O-N-C? Oh, sorry, poverty concentration. Concentration. Uh, so all of those weights remain the same from prior, prior Yes, year. Counselor. Um, we have only increased weights over the last, this is the third year in a row where all of the weights will stay the same or go up. And then um, last on this, um, I saw the, there was soft landings and soft landing sustainability. Yeah. What, can you explain the difference? Go ahead. So our weighted student funding system is based on an idea of um, that the funding system should be able to fund a, a, the instructional needs of a classroom when it is 87.5% full, right? And as a result, you can sort of imagine that if a school, school-wide, is less than 87.5% full, it struggles to uh, fund the base um, needs of any of the school. So the teachers, paraprofessionals, and so on. So the sustainability allocations provide everybody up to a minimum floor of required staffing, mm -hmm. uh, even if weighted student funding is not able to provide that due to uh, sort of chronic empty classrooms. Um, we have nine schools, I believe, that have qualified for that this year, which is similar to what um, we've seen in prior years. 
though I know one of the goals of our uh, build BPS process is to try and help schools that have these types of issues mm -hmm. figure out how they can move away um, from, from that. And we have had some success in the past in moving schools um, out of sustainability. Right. And, and lastly, I just wanted to ask for some lists. So the sure. 76 schools that have overall declining enrollment, um, maybe uh, if you can even sort them by district, maybe. I think that would be helpful for my okay. colleagues. Um, also, the 37 schools that are, you know, that slide 17, if you can provide me the, the detailed back, mm -hmm. backup information on, on those areas, I'd appreciate it. And on human capital, I know that for many years we weren't able to actually uh, enter the competition for recruits because I, I don't remember why, but I remember during John McDonough's interim superintendency, um, he was able to get us to a place where we could compete earlier. And I, I mean, I see the results coming uh, coming recently. Um, I'm wondering. Where were we in 2011 and 12 before that, before those changes? And I, maybe you can speak to the changes, Emily, Why, how we were able to get out and be more competitive in the market. Uh, sure. Um, the, chain, the change in hiring practices started in 2013. Um, and so I'm using a, uh, 2014 as my reference often because we're five years into the changes. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're correct. Um, among the, the, the problems that um, interim superintendent John McDonough helped us solve um, was that before then, we were um, waiting for staffing processes that were, were governed by the contract to play out. And we needed to do that first, and that led to summer hiring for teachers, mm -hmm. um, which is just com common sense that if you're competing for a teacher in August after one of the best mm -hmm. teachers, the, the most diverse um, group of teachers have been hired, you're missing out. Um, so we open all postings, uh, we, we do all hiring starting on March 1st, and our goals are set so that the vast majority of hiring is done before school's out for the summer. The earlier we hire, the more diverse our workforce, the stronger the educators. Right. So I would just ask, like, even if um, looking back, bef yep. sometime before 2013, what were the, what were the percentage of uh, minority um, teachers at that point is it was it 25 percent and now it's 40 was it 30 percent now it's 40 just curious to see yeah. how this uh, policy changes right so result. I can get those numbers for you um, either during this hearing or right after yeah, I'll sure. do that um, and no then works. I could maybe I should get the numbers and then speak to the trends over time sure. I brought data um, starting basically in 2014 Great. So thank you. I'll get it. Thank you, and I apologize for mm -hmm. taking more time. Councilor Anissa Sabi George. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for your um, presentation this afternoon. On the weighted student formula, how do we determine the amounts that we're allocating sort of at the core? Um, so if you could share what the core is and then what the different values are for each weight. So um, our the core amounts um, are set uh, using our staffing guidance, um, which is set through a combination of class size ratios that are in collective bargaining agreements and uh, best practices that are set out by the central office, um, as well as state regulations. Um, so that's sort of the core part of the funding. So what is that value? For, what is for each weight or for? Well, for a student. Um, I imagine we have a weight for an elementary, yeah, a high school, a middle school. Okay, so the uh, the base weights for, so it's at the highest weights are in the, uh, for the youngest students, um, because they have the sort of best, the high, lowest student teacher ratio. So we have, um, um, if we wanna, for sim to simplify it, yeah. we've got students here from East Boston High School. Sure. What's the base weight for a high school student? The, the base weight for a high school student who doesn't have a disability, isn't an English learner, is, um, $5,578. And how do we determine that dollar amount? Uh, that dollar amount is set uh, looking at our staffing guidance around high school, which is a class size uh, max of 31. Yeah. Um, and then how much funding would you need uh, to sort of have the staff required to, to service that class? Mm -hmm. um, 
with 87.5% uh, full um, for that. I can do that math quickly. Um, That's fine. And uh, essentially the idea at high school, um, a typical high school um, teachers are teaching uh, four out of every six periods. So you need sort of one and a half FTE per class. It doesn't actually work out. You don't have one and a half teachers teaching one class of kids. That's not mm -hmm. the way high schools, you know, I mean, you know that. Um, but so essentially you think about it like you have the 31 students, 87.5% full, and then you've got the staffing requirement, which is the one and a half teaching FTE per one class. And then are there any um, ways to, to play with those numbers when a school has either more than six periods? So some schools have seven periods a day sure. or a rotating schedule so that students, at, especially at the high school level, have access to right. electives and honors classes and AP programs. Yeah, so essentially the way this works is that we have the sort of base model that we fund to. Um, and then schools, all schools have uh, some amount of discretionary funding. Now, some schools have more than others <coughs> that they're able to use to make um, strategic decisions about how they want to do that. So let's say a school is doing a rotating A and B period block or they're doing a seven period split over and every one doesn't meet every day or something like that. Um, some of those schedules actually end up costing the, about the same amount as the four out of six traditional. Um, and some are a little bit more expensive. If they're choosing a more expensive schedule, um, then they are using some of their discretionary money to pay for that. Right, so block scheduling, for example, that we see sometimes yeah. reap some academic rewards for students that are in a classroom for a longer period yeah. of time and there can only be four periods or five yeah. periods a day. And we actually have a, a staff member on our finance team who helps schools look at different scheduling options mm -hmm. and think um, there are ways to do sort of modified block schedules uh, so that you still have the same sort of cost, but you can do a variety of different lengths of period. We have some schools that are working on uh, thinking about a 40 and 80 minute mm -hmm. period so that sometimes you're teaching 40 minute periods, sometimes you're teaching 80 so that you have the opportunity to do longer blocks of time, but you're also having things that look more like a traditional period mm -hmm. um, and so on. There's a variety of different things that people are exploring in the system. What would be helpful um, for me is if you could share with us the base weights at all the different levels sure. and then how we're determining yeah the additional values, yep. and with the 87% um, as sort of the breaking point for yep. schools to be able to function at full scale, well, how many schools are not at 87% capacity? Uh, we collect that data for pre-K through eighth grade. Um, it's actually surprisingly hard to calculate in our high schools given the complexity of how master schedules work, but we also have all the data for the Cades, which we can share with you. Mm -hmm. Is that, um, you know, so one of the concerns when we talk about the individual schools, the school losing the most is East Boston High. Yeah. Those are the students that are here. Yeah. It's the school yeah. that I happen to teach at for 13 years, and it's, you know, it makes me very anxious to hear yeah. how much they're losing because of some capacity issues, because because of some of the trends that are happening in, in the neighborhood and across the city. So how do we support a school like that or any of these 30 or so schools that are all losing money this year? Yeah, um, it's definitely a very difficult situation for all the schools, but especially a school like East Boston where the enrollment changes is so much more significant. So I would say there are two main types of things we do. One is this soft landing, right, where we're saying, so the projected enrollment decrease at East Boston High School is 15%, essentially 200 students. Um, and so the, but the actual funding level decrease is 12 and a half percent, which is still very significant. I don't mean to take anything away from that. Um, but we've sort of taken the first 2% plus a little bit more uh, from off of the top of that reduction. The second thing we do is work really collaboratively with the school to ensure that the things that we're reducing are um, the core classes that the students who are no longer attending would take, um, as opposed to the types of additional or supplemental classes that every student might still be interested in. You can imagine if you have 200 fewer students, you just, you can reduce maybe six sections of English, right? 
or uh, six sections of math without having a significant impact on the students who remain uh, versus um, reducing a guidance counselor, uh, social worker, things like that, where they are still working with the students who are still in the school. Um, not that making a reduction is ever easy, uh, but our, our hope is to focus it more on the sort of core supports for the students who will no longer be attending versus those types of discretionary or school-wide supports that are available for all, school, all students. I'll save my questions okay. for the next round. Thank you. Councilor Flynn. Thank you, Council CMO, and thank you to the panelists for being here and for your work and helping our students. Um, I just have two, two basic questions. Can you talk about the recruitment strategy you have um, in kind of identifying uh, potential, potential uh, teachers at some of our colleges and universities? And what type of assistance would you be giving to those potential teachers in terms of um, helping them uh, relocate to Boston, helping them to get accustomed to BPS, um, the recruitment also for ELL, um, you know, teachers that also speak a, um, a language um, other than English as well, and uh, the African American, Latina, Asian, are you also, as it relates to Latina and Asian, are you also looking for them, those teachers to speak, um, you know, Cantonese, or Mandarin, or um, or Spanish. Yeah, I can take it. Hi. Well, we do a myriad of strategies for our recruitment. Um, you asked specifically about colleges. We have very strong relationships with our universities and partners who produce educators, of, and particularly educators of color. We connect with our partner institutions on a regular basis. We invite them in specific ways to attend any of our recruitment events. If you were to look on our website, um, <clears throat> our recruitment events are, in addition to wide open, and anyone can attend any of our recruitment info sessions, we have very specific, unique recruitment events for multilingual educators, um, for educators of color, um, for math, science, and special education. So we diversify the recruitment in the content area. We also focus on the, the multilingual educators, and we also look at educators of color. Um, you asked about L's, and you specifically focused on Cantonese and Spanish. It is of high priority to us, given that, that we have such a large population of educators and students with different language needs, um, that we are also recruiting heavily for educators who speak multiple languages. Thank you. And just as a, as a brief follow-up, do you have a partnership with um, Roxbury Community Co College and <coughs> Bunker Hill Community College in maybe identifying potential teachers? <clears throat> we do have partnerships with four-year and two-year institutions. Um, our partnerships that are growing with our two-year institutions are both their output, meaning getting them out from their second year, their associates program into BA programs, and also partnering with those institutions. We also work with our high school to teacher program, and that program is also looking at partnerships for our high school students to begin their journey into education through their, through their community colleges, if that's their option. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Councilor Campbell. Um, thank you, Councilor Siomo, and uh, thank you to the panelists um, for your hard work and dedication, um, and um, particularly to, you know, on the human capital front, it's not an easy job, so I appreciate and applaud your creative efforts to make our teaching force as diverse as possible. Um, just going back to the weighted, st weighted student formula piece, um, does the... I guess when we talk about poverty, how does it account for poverty? Yeah, so um, there are two main methods in the weighted student formula to account for poverty. Um, the first is we have a, a weight that's explicitly for poverty that is based on direct certification, which is how the state has moved to identifying poverty. And the district moved there when we went to be a fully free lunch district and no longer collected free and reduced price lunch forms. We moved to this new state methodology around direct certification that identifies families that qualify for public services. Um, so our uh, 
we have two weights essentially for students in poverty. One is just for every student in poverty across the district, there's a first weight for those students. And this is on top of um, what's in uh, Title I, which is our federal allocation uh, for students in poverty. And that allocation is uh, $429 per student. And district-wide, we identified 71% of our students qualifying for that. Um, then there's a second allocation. And if I could just interject, mm -hmm. we have nearly $40 million that we allocate uh, for poverty between the general fund and Title I. So that's about, system-wide, that's about uh, just short of $17 million through that weight. There's then a second part of the weight mm -hmm. for poverty, which is for any um, school that has uh, more than 50% students of poverty, which is a, a number of mm -hmm. schools. Um, the, however many kids they have over that 50th percentile, there's a second $429. So essentially the way you can think about that is the dollar per pupil you get for students in poverty starts at $429 if you have less than 50% and rises based on how, what percent students in poverty you have. So the more students in poverty you have, the more dollar per pupil you get. Do we take into consideration um, also where the school is situated, where it's located? So if, if a school, for example, the Burke, which is in my district, the Burke High sure. School, concentrated in a neighborhood of poverty, is that weighted in any way, or is it just I, the student population? promise we didn't plant that question, but it's an amazing one and very timely. So the next way we wait okay. is through the opportunity, through the information from the Opportunity Index. And that way, it doesn't look at where the school is located, but it's where the students are coming from, right? And so if uh, the Burke mm -hmm. is taking a lot of students from the area around the Burke, then it would be related to where the school is located. Um, and the way the, so the opportunity index is a variety of mm -hmm. need-based factors, including socioeconomic factors, but also things like neighborhood uh, crime, educational attainment levels. And um, so in addition to the $22 million that goes out through wage student funding uh, for poverty, there's an additional uh, mm -hmm. 11, well, 10 to $11 million that goes out through the opportunity index. And it goes out through two uh, methods. One is so I, I want to because yeah. time is of the yeah, essence. Okay. So I, I know this piece. Why I asked that question is sure. the Burke High School, for example, sure. under the Opportunity Index, it's almost having the opposite effect. So theirs, their dollars, I think, went down under the Opportunity Index, not up, and that's because I think they have external partnerships. It might also be from where where their students are coming from. So I think there's a difference between looking at where the students are coming from, because not all of those schools pull from kids in the neighborhood versus yeah. where the school is situated. Mm -hmm. But I just okay. want to put that sort of a pin in that. Does the way to student formula take into consideration the type of school? So if, for example, it's an open enrollment high school, like the Burke High School, East Boston, Charlestown? It does not. And why, why I say that is because we know that our open enrollment high schools in particular, unlike the exam schools, selective schools, are, are, are sort of the staff and teachers are charged with teaching, of course, yes. and, and meeting the needs of our most neediest. So usually it's the folks with the highest um, needs in terms of uh, special ed, poverty, trauma, um, maybe they're new arrivals to this country, English isn't the first language. Um, we've talked about this in various hearings, how this sort of concentrated or packed into our open enrollment high schools. And so then of course it gets a little troubling when you look at the number, the amount of funding um, that the open enrollment high schools get compared to their counterparts. So uh, I just, one question was just, do we take that in consideration in the open enrollment, the type of high school that it is? The other is schools that have the ability to, obviously we talked about this yesterday, fundraise on their own. I'm thinking about Boston Latin School. I'm thinking about um, other high schools that have that ability to fundraise either because of foundations or even in the community where they are situated. There's a, an ability to have certain types of partnerships. Maybe it's uh, colleges or hospitals or whatever else. Um, does the weighted student formula, formula take any of that into consideration when, um, when, when distributing resources for students? Not yet, not today, it does not. I think it's an important question for us to be discussing as a community of what options there would be to improve the equity. Um, 
On the first question you asked about open enrollment schools, yeah. I want to start by saying we agree. Yeah. We think the data is very clear that we have concentrated need in some of our schools to a greater degree than others, which is I think when you, it, which is why when you look at when we've been able to put more money into school budgets for the last three years, we have had a laser-like focus on two things. One is stability and the other is equity. And stability means supporting schools with declining enrollment. It's primarily the 2% buffer that I mentioned. And the second is equity. As we looked at some of the recommendations, for instance, that came out of the Parthenon report that looked at concentrations of mm -hmm. need, um, we felt like the opportunity index was a good tool to help directly address some of the issues that were raised in that report and that we've all known about in Boston for many, many years. And so each year we're trying to do more and more so that the differentiation grows in the funding. Well, I'll just add, because I, I heard the buzzer beep, you know, I, I think we're going to keep coming back to this issue of the schools and the students that need the most yes. will never get it unless we start doing some real drastic stuff um, to change, whether it's the weight and student formula or the opportunity index or tweaking that to really meet the needs of my, our students. Um, talking about um, inequities, not just in the school realm, because we know it's also affected by where schools are located housing patterns, segregation from the past in the city of Boston, all of these inequities will continue to persist um, unless we do something drastic in addressing those inequities and applying an equity lens um, and particularly looking at our open enrollment high schools. That's what I'm focusing on right now, not just because of East Boston, but Burke and other places or some of our standalone middle schools um, that are struggling to meet the needs of those students. Um, and the formulas are not they're just not quite there, right, to, um, to get them the resources they need um, to, to meet the needs of their families and their students. I know we're short on time, yeah. Councilor, but if I could add one more thing, I, I would again say we agree. Um, I, I want to note that Boston has a strong starting point when it comes to equity, but everyone at this table is committed that we need to do more, that we're not doing enough. Um, we, when we did the per pupil analysis that's posted on our website now, the school with the lowest per pupil funding is Boston Latin. And I, I think if you look at school districts across the country, that type of commitment to equity is not always reflected. And so I think we should say, we have a starting point that's not bad, but we need to do more. Um, with new money that's come in, our focus has been on stability and equity. I think we could continue to have a conversation if we're not moving fast enough, yeah. then it requires frankly, taking from some to give to others. Yes. And that crosses a line which we've done only very selectively um, and is a, I think, fruitful conversation for this body to engage in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Councilor. you, Councilor Seale. Sure. Councilor Janey. Thank you so much. Um, let me just open up by saying um, thanks to Easty for being in the house. Um, my daughter went to East Boston High School when she was a freshman, and I served on the school site council, so it's great to see Nina and the young people um, here, and thank you for opening up the hearing with their testimony. I think it's always important to include their voices. Um, I have a number of schools in my district that are seeing decreases from FY19 to 20. Is that because of the declining enrollment? What, what is that? So I have the Higgison Lewis, the Winthrop, the Ellis, Dudley Street Neighborhood School, the Trotter, and the Hale that are all seeing cuts. Is that because of the de uh, projected declining enrollment? What, what do we make of that? Because clearly all of these schools are attracting students who would receive um, you know, greater dollar amounts based on the student population. These are these are students who are coming from communities that are in deep poverty. These are students of color. These are students who uh, have disabilities, who have language needs. So why are we seeing those types of cuts for those six schools? Is it the enrollment? Uh, yes, so the, the primary reason would be the enrollment. And what I would say is we work carefully with each of the schools to figure out you know, what's happening and what is, what if anything can we do to um, address the concerns or issues at the school. So actually in the um, final uh, approved budget um, from the school committee, the Hale is actually, uh, their budget is now up. Uh, okay, so the Higginson and the Winthrop though, according to at least what I have in front yeah. of me, see uh, significant cuts, 9% and 8%. Yeah, so let me pull them up very quickly. 
So yeah, so the Higginson Lewis uh, is definitely a significant change right there. Enrollment is down, uh, projects to be down about 15%. So uh, that's 45 students in a school that only started with 300. Um, so it's a very significant reduction. And I think um, some of what's happening there uh, relates to no longer needing a classroom. Um, so we were able to close one classroom and the hope would be when you close a classroom that you can identify a way through sort of natural turnover to not lose a teacher who would have stayed in the building otherwise and you can have a relatively limited impact mm -hmm. on students but um, yep. I'm sorry David I've got to continue yeah, to move on so these if you can yeah. keep your answers very brief I will that would be helpful um, so overall though we see in Boston 76 schools with declining enrollment yes. and what do we make of that there are only what 125 126 schools overall so to see the vast majority of schools with declining enrollment are they going to the other 24% uh, schools in BPS are they leaving the district and going to charters or MECO, parochial, what is happening with? Uh, this October, our enrollment numbers that we sent to DESE had a 2% decline district-wide, which was a loss of approximately 1,200 students versus the previous October. Um, I mentioned this on Tuesday, so I apologize for being redundant, but DESE does collect information by sector that has not yet been released. So we don't have perfect answers yet because we can't say whether the parochial schools or private schools went up. Um, we know the charter numbers because of the cap situation roughly, give or take. Right. Um, and we're digging into it. I don't think there's any one answer to it. It's a combination of rising housing prices in East Boston, which was the neighborhood that was hit the hardest, demographic shifts, um, and it, it is a, we are 1,200 students smaller this year than we were last yep. year, and so, um, so that I'm is an adjustment. I'm going to switch over to OHC. Thank yep. you so yep. much. Thank I you. appreciate that, uh, both of you. Um, are we looking at new hires? Are we including provisionals? What What are these numbers really saying? You You know the questions I'm going to ask. Yep. So, um, what What data do I have in front of me here uh, when you, we when we talk about these increases? You can have any data you want, um, Councillor Janey. I think you're looking at which which slide number you're looking at. It's not numbered. Um, high touch support schools. So these are the schools yeah. that the equity office would be working with the the school leader there to mm -hmm. help them improve their diversity numbers. Is, do I understand that correctly? It's, oh, yes. And those are overall hires, external and internal. Yeah. So if we break that down. Yeah. So how many of these are actual new hires and not provisionals that are being rehired who did not uh, get their, their LOA or yep. whatever it is, and, um, or right. LOI? So overall hiring, um, we had, just to give you a sense of scope, 969 um, overall hires. That includes people moving school to school, provisionals rehired, and external um, hires. And, we, and of those 969, 338 total in the district or external hires. So I'm happy you and, and for those numbers, what are we looking at in terms of diversity? Okay, so for the 338 external hires new to BPS, 18.64 um, are identified as black. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed yep. that, how many? Sure, 18.64, it's percentage, mm -hmm. percentage points. 13.02% at Latinx, 7.69% Asian, 55.62% white. So, so it seems to me that we still have a lot of work to do. Um, I'm being informed that my time has, has run out. Yep. Um, so to close, I guess, I, I would really prefer to see, um, we can look at the overall hires, yep. but I need to see the breakdown so that we understand <laughs> how many are, are new hires to the district versus provisionals that are being have, yep, kind of counted in that number so that we can get a true sense of how we're moving sure. forward. And then finally, doesn't the equity office still have sign-off ability on these hires and how is that being used or not being it? used? Because Please. yeah, it would suggest to me that it's not being used if I see that these external numbers look the way they do in terms of the diversity that we're not really no. using that sign off? We are absolutely still partnering with Becky mm -hmm. Schuster. She's usually presenting with us. It's different this year, um, but she's still deeply involved. The approach of focusing on the diversity focus schools with Becky's partnership and with Colin's partnership and with Mary Driscoll's partnership has been the one that we've taken over the, the past couple years. So you direct us if we come back around to you and you want to get into 
something different, we can. Yeah. Some data that, around that would externals. Be helpful. And then the last thing uh, for the um, the program that uh, tracks the high school students and encourage. Mm -hmm. What do we call that, Sarah? High school teacher. Yeah. How many how many high school students have been hired? Have been hired. <clears throat> We have one of our high school students in this last cohort is at doing their city year, so we have a partnership with city No, no, no. Year. How many high school we, students we haven't got, they're, they're, since the beginning of this program X not, number of years ago? It's, it's, the program is in its fourth year, I believe, and it is not, the kids haven't gotten I thought you year. did it way back when. You're talking Teach Boston, Boston with um, oh, okay. Anissa and I are smiling. Oh, um, okay. No, <laughs> the district had a Teach Boston program. And just to say, many of the students, we have students in our district now who are teachers from when Anissa and I did it in Eastie. So you're, what, we, what I can share with you currently are, is the leading pack. We have a student who is at our in-city year doing his gap year that will be starting his um, undergrad experience in the fall. And then so grad he's, school yeah. and then so eventually. He's, correct. So he's the first student that is populating and starting our city year partnership. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging cool. me with a little more time. I'll okay. save the rest for the second round if Thank I'm you. still here. Council Thank you. McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, and welcome again. See, you. We'll be seeing you often this next couple of weeks. I just have a quick, uh, couple of quick questions, mainly from um, uh, the slide, uh, the priorities and funding. Um, first one, um, we have 75 schools with decreasing enrollment um, and I know that uh, Chairman Sioma would ask for that list, which would be which would be great. Uh, in 25 schools losing full-time employees, are those overlapping? E yes, it's a subset of it, the 70. It's of subset 70. of 75. Okay, and we'll see that in the what with the yes. file. You, that'd be great. Um, second question: um, So you have an additional 0.6 million uh, to the vocational tech. I know we had a uh, hearing not too long ago. Um, what are the thoughts on uh, future increasing to the voc tech uh, line? So um, we, one of our weights and weight student funding is for vocational ed, and uh, it's been growing over the last several years. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest things it's tied to is enrollment at Madison Park. Um, initial data for next year is encouraging that we are continuing to see uh, strong growth in the programming at Madison Park. Um, and so, you know, the hope is that it will continue. Yeah, that's great. Uh, <coughs> Council Baker and I and Senator Collins uh, visited a school uh, that has uh, Votech and then they took it to another level. So your traditional Votech yeah. of uh, car mechanic, plumber, sure. electrical, uh, HVAC, that type of stuff. And then across the street they had another one which was a hospitality Votech. Um, uh, pastry chefs, chefs, baristas, bartenders, yes. uh, waiters, waitresses. Yeah. Um, and it was phenomenal uh, to see uh, you know young people who school wasn't for them but they weren't, they didn't want to be a carpenter either. Um, right. And they're in, it's performing great career. So, you know, thinking outside the box like that, I'm happy to hear mm -hmm. uh, once again that the, the mayor is committing more money to on the vote tech uh, area. And maybe next year or in future years, we expand that to that type of hospitality and things, especially yeah. Boston, um, you know, we run on hospitality here, as you know, um, with visitors from all over the world. Um, it's a business that you can uh, do very well in uh, yeah. if done right. And then uh, lastly, uh, the school leadership uh, development, w what exactly is that? School leadership development, so the school leadership development programs? Yes, please. Um, so there are a couple different initiatives we have. One is in a recognition that we have turnaround schools in the district and that leading a turnaround school takes a different set of school uh, skills than um, a typical school. Um, we are partnering with the University of Virginia. That is. Um, a partnership where they do two things. They help develop the actual skills of the leaders of those schools. We have six of them. I'm happy to tell you which ones those are. They also require the central office to change the way that we support schools. They believe you can't just take even a rock star principal, put them into one of our toughest schools and say, good luck. So that has caused us to allocate our supports differently. Okay. So la last question, so Virginia, I'm glad, you know, University of Virginia, phenomenal. How, how come we're not working, are we working with like Northeastern, Harvard, BU, for things yes. like this? Sa Saren could describe, we have partnerships with UMass Boston, other um, higher eds um, around yeah. leadership. We yeah. contracted with them because they have results in turnaround schools specifically as a, as a niche. Uh -huh. uh, but we do work with our, with our local ed right. educators. It sounds like if we... If, if, if Virginia can do it, then certainly we should be able to do it here. And we're always looking to gain on our, the pilot obviously is a huge issue yep. on this floor. It might be an area where, um, you know, we can push 
our local universities to step up a bit. Yeah, this is a short-term partnership. Those are longer-term partnerships. Great. So when those when that when those results come out from Virginia, we should really kind of put that on our local colleges mm -hmm. and say why are we Let's shipping do it to up Virginia. Here. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Thank yep. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Council Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to do a little deeper dive on the 76 schools that um, have uh, declining enrollment that was on the presentation uh, on page 17. So can you provide me a list of those schools um, and maybe give me a sense as to uh, what your thoughts are as to why uh, uh, we are experiencing um, declining enrollment in, in those schools? Yeah, I, I'm afraid there aren't any easy answers. We saw declines across almost every neighborhood and program area. The area, neighborhoods with the largest declines were East Boston and the northern part of Dorchester. And we saw the reductions across every program area except our higher needs special education areas, which continue to go up. Um, so I, you know, I apologize, there's not an easy answer, but it, it was surprisingly widespread. Any correlation between parochial, a charter, a METCO, or any, anything like that? Um, not that we have data available yet. We're eagerly awaiting when DESE releases its data from this year, because the okay. previous year's data that we do have available doesn't suggest that. Right. And from sort of like, and, and so of the 76 schools, uh, 37 of which they have increasing um, uh, Budget, budget issues, right? So from sort of an, a, a management and operation perspective, that's something that's arguably you would say it's upside down where we're actually educating less children, but it's costing us more money. So I, I guess what are those investments that we're, we're making um, and or what are those increased needs to the 37 of the 76 schools that are declining enrollment? Those would be a combination of one or one of two things. We have been making investments specifically to try to cushion the blow for mm -hmm. schools, knowing that it was it's hard to reduce staff, uh, particularly with small enrollment changes. So one of it is ex ex the explicit decision to invest. The second is um, a school that, for instance, might add an ABA classroom to serve students with autism. And that classroom is more expensive on a per pupil basis, so even though they might have fewer students in the school, their cost could be going up. And we have seen a very dramatic increase in our students with autism in the last uh, five or six years in particular. And then when we increase the, um, when we, I guess we increase the funding there, what, I guess what are the metrics, what are we looking for um, in terms of, I guess, a turnaround or uh, an increase? And, and a lot of times, and as, a, as a parent with, uh, that's in uh, children's with the Boston Public Schools, it's, sometimes it's uh, strong parental involvement, sometimes there's a buzz, uh, you know, almost like a PR, um, effort behind a particular school. It could be advanced work, it could be this school, it could be that school. So I guess what are the things that we could do in the, um, in the declining enrollment? Is it, is it new leadership? Is it getting stronger parental involvement? Um, is it smaller class size? Is it art, music, and sporting programs? Like, yeah. what do they say? At some point, I want to come to a budget hearing as the longest mm -hmm. serving and we'll just have a discussion about academic excellence yeah. right, and smaller class size. And we talk about like so many, a myriad of different issues that uh, whether it boils down to the classroom or not. And at the end of the day, for me, we're, we're in a global economy. Okay. We boast of the best colleges and universities in the world, but yet not enough for our kids are getting into these schools. So, like, so what are we doing? It's not good enough for me that we just graduate a kid from high school. Um, and again, not, to, to my colleague's point, school's not for everyone, I get that, and we clearly uh, have opportunities through, through Voc Tech um, and, and other pathways, but, but uh, what a travesty it is that we, have, we actually have the best colleges and universities in the world that call Boston their home, and not enough of our kids are able to get into those schools, and, I, and I, it just that, that probably pains me more than, than anything when we, when we sit here and talk about a budget. I, I want to talk about academic excellence. I want smaller class size. I want college prep. I want APs. I want more advanced work. I want sports, arts, music. We want everything that all these suburban uh, communities have in their schools. And I just think sometimes we get caught up on other stuff and we start banging our heads up against the wall to satisfy a whole variety of different uh, uh, agendas and, and, um, uh, and uh, you know, it's. Uh, if everyone has kind of, if, if you think you think about every every audience that you, that the most important audience is obviously is the children in the classroom and the families of that child in the classroom. But it just seems like this between just, and you know it. I mean, there's probably more politics in the Boston Public Schools than, than in City Hall, you know. And and I, and I just think that we always lose sight of that fact. So, I just would like to get your thoughts on 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 those issues. I think. Um, one of our core investments in this cycle is, um, and uh, Monica Roberts isn't here today, but I've heard her talk about this a number of times, is um, 
uh, sort of improving the, the, the market and the brand of BPS mm -hmm. because I think one of the things that happens in a number of these hearings is we talk about things that are going wrong or we talk about things that aren't the way we want to see them and that overshadows sometimes the really excellent things that are happening in a lot of our schools. Um, and so part of our work over the next few years, I think, and is represented in this budget is to really help shine a light on some of the really excellent things that are happening in BPS schools yeah. um, and through other investments like um, doing ISEE in the classroom and other things yeah. really help put more of our students on the track towards those elite right. colleges and universities, though I think we would agree with you that the gap is, is significant and one right. we need to right. address. And through the chair, I would suggest potentially with those 76 schools, I would recommend cutting the class size in half and putting a second teacher in that classroom. I think that's going to create a tremendous buzz. I think those schools will turn around pretty quickly. I think that there'll be a demand for folks to want to send their children there. Um, I mean, those are some of the, you think about some of, uh, and, and, I, and I've always felt that competition's good, uh, it's healthy. Um, so we have competition, as Boston Public Schools, we have competition. We have competition from, from parochial schools, from private schools, from, from charter schools, and some of those successful models uh, that we've seen in, in some of the successful charters, and they're not all successful, but some have been smaller class size, uh, two teachers in a classroom. So I just think that, you know, with respect to those 76 schools that were experiencing declining enrollment or for our underperforming schools, I think the time is we just cut the class size in half, add a second teacher, and let's make a run with it. Let's try something a little different and see if we get some results. I, there's got to be metrics on that the, the increased investment. When we're educating less kids than we were last year, 5, 10, 15 years ago, but we continue to spend more money, uh, just from an operations and management standpoint, it, it just it, it begs these questions. At the end of the day, it's taxpayer dollars. We all have a fiduciary responsibility to put the best product out there, and I, I just think that that may be something you want to look at with respect to those schools. So thank you for your time and attention. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. Thank you very much. Um, so I just wanted to go back to the weighted student formula and ask, um, along with some of the other categories or, I guess, the weights that you guys have in assessing poverty and uh, needs such as language skills, ELL, uh, disability, I'm assuming physical, but also learning, IEPs. So uh, do you, in, in assessing your, um, your poverty analysis, do, is it uh, based on concentrations you said specifically? It's, it's both the total number of students mm -hmm. and the concentration. And total number of students on what? That, that are measured, maybe have food stamps or getting free lunch? Or uh, how are you measuring the poverty of a student? Yes. Um, it, the measure used to be free and reduced price lunch forms that right. were filled out, and it's now something that the state calls direct certification, where we go through an annual process of matching our student records with state records. And the families that have any form of public assistance are what we call direct certification. So um, schools with high populations of immigrants who are undocumented who receive no state funds, uh, but still could very well be poor. Um, that is an issue that has concerned us that we've spent a lot of time studying in the last couple of years. Because our undocumented families are undocumented, we've struggled to analyze whether or not that concern, how it's playing out. Right. Um, and that was part of the impetus for implementing the Opportunity Index, which drew on a wider variety of data than the direct certification. But but uh, I guess my concern is because yours is so populate, the weighted student formula is so population uh, dependent, right? And if you're not accounting for uh, the poverty needs of all of the students in a school because of immigration status, you, you could actually not be weighting them all correctly. Or um, enough. Sorry, what's that? Or enough. Yes, um, we, I'd be, um, we, we did a very thorough look of when the, the shift when we went from free and reduced price lunch forms over to the direct certification, and we saw only very small changes in which neighborhoods and schools and student populations were receiving funds. Do you um, think, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. do you think you're catching them uh, with the ELL weights, potentially? Um, it, I, I, it would be hard for me to conjecture, okay. um, but our intention is for those are, those are for separate purposes. Our ELL weights are yeah. for different instructional needs, and the poverty weights are to acknowledge and support the needs that students have who live in poverty. So, but again, acknowledging that there's a yeah. you know, the gap. With, uh, and, in, and in terms of uh, displacement or homelessness, 
how is homelessness accounted for in the weights? Yeah, so there's there are two particular weights that, that deal with homelessness. Um, similar to poverty, there's both a total number of homeless students, and there's a flat amount, also $429, that a school gets for every student that is homeless. Mm -hmm. There's also an acknowledgement that schools that have a concentration of homeless students might experience a more, um, it might be more challenging to support when there is that concentration. Mm -hmm. um, and that threshold is set at about 5%, so essentially one student per classroom. How do you, again, determine who's homeless? How are you getting that information? How do you determine? Uh, it's reported by each of the schools. So uh, when we, any time we have an indication that a family is homeless, okay. it's not, there's not a perfect system, but um, especially once we started funding for it, we got a lot better data. So it, it was um, interesting news to me to know, learn from the Children's Health Watch that the learning impacts on homeless students are uh, equally uh, seen in kids who are facing displacement and impacts them the same way. And so I'm wondering if your weights account for displacement um, for those families, because um, we're, we're in a displacement crisis in East Boston, and I'm wondering if your weights account for that, considering the injury on the children's capacity to learn, their depression, their growth, are the same. Go ahead. Um, so one of the things we do every year is take feedback on how the weights are working. Mm -hmm. um, and in this year's, um, cycle, one of the things I've heard some schools talk about is student mobility in general, right? Students moving between schools, students moving between homes, and the impact that can have on education. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't think that's limited to displacement, but I think displacement is a part of that. Um, and so one of the things we are co consistently looking to do is identify things we can measure, right. and then um, uh, test to see if those things are linked to educational outcomes, which it seems like You've got some research that says they are, which is great. Um, and then we identify ways to fund it. So three or four years ago, that was homelessness, and we did identify funds to invest in that. Um, and so I know that student mobility, and now I'll add displacement to my list uh, of things that we will be investigating over the summer uh, as potential um, items for investment. Um, and so I, I, I'm going to write down that uh, article you said and, and go home and read it. Thanks. I'll wait to the next round. Councilor Zakem has joined us. Do you have any questions, Council? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Councilor Sabi George. Sure, thank you. And if I could, through the chair, um, just continue some of the your response to Councilor Edwards about how we count and how we're accounting for students experiencing homelessness. It is often um, students self-identifying through, through the school, but it's also part of the transportation piece when right. students mm -hmm. are housed or sheltered outside of the city of Boston. Um, that transportation indicator is something that's yes. important for that calculating. And also for the record, just because we can't say it enough or share the information enough, right now we've um, accounted for 4,200 students in the Boston Public Schools experiencing homelessness. That's what we've counted. We think the number is much closer to 5,000. Um, and thank you, Councilor Edwards, for your um, questioning and attention to that. It's a very important population. When we look at declining enrollments, because it's so critical to the weighted student formula piece and school budgets, are we um, then analyzing, A, why students are leaving, and I think that that question is sort of um, has been asked, but are we also looking at the number of students who are waitlisted in the lower grades that we as a district should really be capturing? I had a conversation yesterday morning with a number of um, moms with younger children in Charlestown. And the wait lists in Charlestown have tripled in a number of the schools. So how, how, if those kids aren't accessing BPS for K-1 or K-2, we may never get them and that creates a bigger problem for us down the road. How can we be responsive to that and really meet the needs of our families before they leave the district, actually move out of the district or out of the city, or leave the district and enter um, either the charter school or a private parochial school. Hi. Hi. Uh, Nate Cooter, Deputy CFO. Um, as part of our work with Build BPS, we are certainly looking at ways to expand access for families in um, neighborhoods. Part of our uh, fact base that we included was access to seats close to home and to identify the neighborhoods that where we have the, the largest struggle of assigning students. Um, and we're also overlaying that with demand data as well to see where are the schools in particular that 
um, are in demand um, and how can we look to um, meet that demand in a better way. Um, I, unfortunately, um, because of both rising student need in special education and the need to prioritize programmatic placement in elementary schools in particular, and the legacy of K-8 expansion that took up a lot of our elementary school classrooms with those sixth, seventh, and eighth grades being added, and now I'm talking about 10, 12 years ago when a lot of that work was done, there isn't a lot of room to expand early childhood um, classrooms, which is why we're working on the mayor's UPK plan to do more community-based programs. We're looking at ways to create um, uh, the connectors to schools so that when families are enrolling in those expanded uh, UPK seats, that they may also be guaranteed a seat in a specific Boston Public School so they can be start becoming involved in those school communities um, earlier. But, you know, this is a priority for us. It's now just a matter, unfortunately, of of physical space and classroom space to do expansion in places like Charlestown um, where we have seen an increase in demand and, um, you know, particularly for the high quality schools that are there. I have, um, you know, it, it worries me when we're not able to respond to the needs of those newer families here in the district because we're going to, you know, we'll, we'll continue to talk about things like what's happening at East Boston High with declining enrollments. If we can't get them in in those early years, it's really hard to capture them. Um, to capture them later on. When we talk about those declining enrollments and then the, the resulting decline in school budgets, when, you know, I think David, you referenced the sort of the, the default cutting of English teachers or math teachers because it's, um, it, because of the impact on the school community. Are we seeing an increase in the cutting of non-classroom adults in the building, so paras and um, family coordinators, community coordinators, people who don't aren't necessarily teaching in right. any of the subject areas, but supporting those teachers both in the classroom as paras or the school community as a whole? Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head whether we're seeing an increase in that relative to prior years. What I can say is some analysis we've done suggests that about um, before we started implementing some of our newer um, soft landings, about 75% of um, reductions that were uh, coming due to enrollment were of that first group of staff. Um, and then about 25% were the school-wide or discretionary staff. And I think our, one of our goals is to really go after that 25% uh, and make sure that schools as much as possible are able to keep those um, staff members. And so what we do every winter is we're working with each of the schools experiencing declining enrollment and trying to identify ways to um, help them keep those staff who are school-wide, who are working with the kids who remain um, as well. And then I, I know one of the unfortunate um, things that happen during this process is schools are declining budgets. We're hearing, I think, at East Boston High, 16 um, adults in the building, a combination of teachers, administrators, and others are going to be losing their jobs potentially or likely. Um, but then over the next few months, we start to recalculate some of that and bring people in. And that, that period of time really uh, works at the morale of that school community. We see that in sort of the resulting impacts in developing our human capital, our resources in the schools. So if we talk, just when, when we do that to adults, it traumatizes the kids. It has a very direct impact on the kids. But it's really hard to have a stable workforce um, when we're doing that every single year in school communities. So I don't know if we can talk a little bit about how those dollar amounts we know affect the staffing levels, but then that really creates a very direct impact on the, the quality of, of life uh, the adults and the quality of life for the school community. I don't know if that's a human capital question or a budget question. It's a combination of both, I think. Yeah. Want to start? What, what I would say is, I think one of the things you know we heard loud and clear when, uh, uh, at least when I came in four years ago, was um, you know the the goal of our system is to not be in a place where we're making reductions in the winter teachers are getting accessed, and then we're coming back in the spring and summer and fall and reopening their positions. 
um, and causing unnecessary trauma and disruption in a school. Um, and so one of the things we are doing is constantly monitoring all the best available data even through the process so that we're waiting until the last possible moment to send a teacher an excess notice um, so that if a trend changes and all of a sudden we think perhaps we can make an adjustment to projections, um, we will do that. Um, and we're having those conversations with school leaders November through February, really, before the excess letters are going out. Um, well, that was said well. We are paying great attention to um, when adults are notified um, and as David said, last possible second and with um, when we have all the evidence and all the data we're gonna have to make that decision. And, and I guess I, just to give one specific example, we had a school with a special education classroom that was no longer needed, substantially separate, which in some ways is good news, right? We're expanding inclusion, less substantially separate. But it means that that teacher's position was going to be cut out of the school. And one of the things we were able to do was identify the fact that that school would be willing to take a placement of a new special education program, and that teacher would be willing to teach in the slightly different but still substantially separate special ed program. And instead of waiting until we needed that program six months later, we were able to open it in the same school at the same time as we were reducing the other program. And so the teacher never got an access notice, they were never um, cut from the school. Um, and we did open that classroom at the beginning of the year instead of when we actually needed it, which was probably in March or April, um, and save some of that disruption. So while there is disruption, and I don't mean to take anything away from that, uh, we are working as hard as we can to limit it, um, uh, limit the unnecessary disruption. And I would also um, state that whenever, when we have educators who are part of our district that we really respect and want to stay in our district, we also have specific recruitment events just for those educators. So they get a chance in a much more intimate setting as educators that we all want to retain to meet other school leaders who are also looking to hire really strong and valuable educators. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. Thank you. So just following up on my, um, the way to student formally, um, the, the budgeting, uh, with that analysis, do so most of those decisions for the weighted suited formula for the f next year, for example, is be, is made about what time? Uh, okay. So the decisions for this for this budget cut and so on and so forth, the one point two million was made when? So the initial uh, enrollment projections mm -hmm. go out to schools at the beginning of November. Okay, they give feedback uh, throughout November. Then a initial budget goes out in early December to schools. They're working then with their school site councils, providing us additional feedback. We're still making adjustments all the way through December and January. Mm -hmm. And that gets us to a place where we're proposing a budget to school committee in the first week of February. Okay. Um, and then there are still adjustments that are made through the school committee process uh, until it's the final budget's approved in, in March. Okay. For, for it to really be implemented this school year coming exactly up right. in the fall. Exactly right. So what, how does your budget then account for um, increased in population? So we, we end up, for example, with, I've just heard um, 15 new students in East Boston in the middle of the school year who are yeah. all immigrants who just showed up, which is yeah. beautiful that we're welcoming, that they're coming to our schools. How do you account for increased in populations like that? Yeah. Or as some people have called it, a purge from the Excel uh, charter schools yeah. when they also just come, the students who are no, not working out there right. come to BPS in the middle of the school year. Are those funds coming immediately with them to help or with based on population projections, we now have a budget cut for a certain population that went up, but the money didn't as well. So, so our projections, um, when we're reviewing projections and, and reviewing student data, we're looking at it at a variety of points of time in the year when we look backwards so that we can make our projections going forwards based on all of the data. So uh, the enrollment projections uh, team called Planning and Analysis, they do snapshots in multiple times of the year to look at how enrollment uh, is changing over time and the impact that that might have on a school budget. Uh, so for example, in a lot of our high need special education programs, their highest enrolled time of the year is in June. And so we're actually projecting to their highest point. Um, so our, our goal is always to do that. What I would say is sometimes we are not able to project correctly. That, well, it's um, a projection, right? It's right, an it's, estimate. We, so, and, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. So your highest, so the 
the 200 student drop is to the highest um, population projection for East Boston. At our highest, we'd still lose 200. That is that is projection. What the, that is what the projection is based on at the sort of the the highest point. And, um, and then mm -hmm. the other thing that we do is we are constantly monitoring. We have a team that meets throughout the entire year to respond to changes in enrollment that we are did not predict. Mm -hmm. So for example, I say two years ago, there were a lot of um, new, uh, students who were new to the country who spoke Vietnamese who were 11th graders academically. I don't know why, they, and they all showed up at Excel High School in January or February. We, we hadn't projected that, it's not happened since, but what we did do because this team meets, the school leader reported that this had happened, um, and we were able to assign additional staff out to the school to meet the needs of those students. It's what our weighted student funding reserve is for. So if there is something that we haven't projected, we are allocating additional funds out to schools if they do not have the staff and supports they need to meet um, the needs of the kids who are arriving. How much is in the reserve? Uh, let's see. Uh, it's around $5 million at the moment. And then were you gonna answer more specifically about how the money follows or when the money comes in? Uh, or was anyone going to, I'm just genuinely curious. So yeah, the kids come from Excel in the middle of the year. Right. So we do, if, um, the, I think there's two parts to it. One, we've started doing enrollment reconciliations uh, for school. It's currently in the fall when we do the enrollment reconciliation. That's the place, particularly at high schools, where we see the largest general education population. So it's rare that we would have projected a school to have, let's just say, 200 students in the fall and then in the spring, um, they all of a sudden get an influx of that. I know that there, the, the charter um, uh, effect that you're talking about where um, there are students who are unenrolling from charter schools and coming to BPS is something that is uh, fairly consistent. Um, I don't have the exact numbers for Excel affecting, um, Excel charter affecting East Boston High School, but um, it is something that we see across. It's the, sh the sudden influxes that tend to be um, less accounted for. The thing that David mentioned around uh, sudden influx of students who speak Vietnamese or where um, we see a change in demographic shifts, um, those are unpredictable. By and large, the biggest factor that we see is the number of students who are in your school this year is the largest predictor of who's in your school next year. The biggest factor affecting English, uh, excuse me, East Boston High School for next year is the size of the current ninth grade, or current ninth grade class and projected ninth grade class for next year compared to the seniors who are exiting the building. These large demographic trends are much bigger than even shifts in demand. We see the demand is fairly static. Um, so the demographic trends both citywide, regionally, and throughout New England around an aging population that's having children later, um, less students uh, per household, the age and demographics moving out of high school at this point are not being replaced by the same size cohorts. Those are the things that are affecting us more than the one-off um, development or the demand and opinion of people around BPS. We really see that these are the larger demographic trends affecting us, which is why it's by working with the BPDA, we're starting to get much more um, nuanced and stable in terms of our understanding of where neighborhood trends are going. Oh, wait. Councilor Zakem. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate my colleagues bringing this. I, I do have one follow-up question. I think, uh, David, you touched on it. Um, when you're predicting enrollment, uh, when you're looking at the projections, you said you go to the highest point, and that's how schools are staffed for. Is that? Yeah. Well, we, do, um, we refer to it as, as a high, looking at high watermark data. What well, we look across um, the district by grade and by program is what's our peak enrollment and how many students are we gonna have to serve at our max in that year. David mentioned um, the, the best example of a, of a program that grows throughout the year is our early childhood special education mm -hmm. for three-year-olds and four-year-olds. They have these either um, what we call center-based substantially separate classrooms or early childhood ABA classrooms for students with autism. We have an obligation as the, um, the school district to identify students as soon as they turn three and start serving them as soon as, as, soon as they turn mm -hmm. three. So whereas general education students, there's a cutoff, you have to be a certain age by September 1st. If you turn three on June 1st, we are uh, obligated and provide you a seat in one of our schools. As a result of that, you see that enrollment grow throughout the year. 
For other populations, you see a decline. High school students, general education, our peak enrollment's in October, and then you see it decline throughout the year. So what we're looking across the district, and then we look by grade and by program across the district, and then for individual schools, we're looking to see, are there schools that have peak enrollment that differ from the district? So, but for budgeting and staffing, you are doing it for the peak. You're not saying, that's right. we think, you know, we'll be somewhere in between. You're doing it for what the highest projection is. Right, we, we try and aim to say, what's the maximum number of students you're gonna serve at your school, and how many of that, you know, uh, and, and how many will we have to fund for that? And of course, as David mentioned, um, you know, I like to say projections are always wrong. We try and make them useful. Thank you. And just to follow up on that, um, according to our information here, you're basing um, all the funding on 54,781 students. Does that sound right? So that's the uh, number of students um, in weighted student yes. funding schools. There are also six other programs that are funded um, not involving the weighted student funding schools. Uh, like Madison. Uh, Madison no. is a weighted student funding oh, school, okay. so their enrollment projections. I'm thinking of schools like um, the, um, Carter. the Carter, Carter School, Carter, right. McKinley. Uh, McKinley schools. Um, Horseman. Yeah, so the total number we're using, if you include those um, additional schools, is 55,668. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And the challenge with that number is that because we are doing what Nate said around the high water mark, it may not be that that's the exact number of kids of at any one given time. Right. Um, Nate has a great stat I like about the number of unique kids we serve over the course of the year. Right. It's much higher right. than the number of kids we're serving at any one given time. It's always time. a moving target. Yeah. Right. Um, could you get us like the historical data, like let's say the last seven years of projections and actuals for every school year from say 2013? Um, you know, I, I don't need you to tick it off or anything, but if you could provide it to the body, that would be great. Uh, I, I, we will go back and pull the data that we have. Are you looking at for the district overall? Yes. And then yeah. I think in that case, what we would we might recommend doing is showing um, the three different snapshots that we tend to look at, the right. October, December, June. Right. And I'll see for how many years we can get both our projections right. and the actuals for those different snapshots right. so you can see the fluctuations. Um, this is a note where the planning analysis team has been doing the enrollment projections. I think this is our third budget cycle. Mm -hmm. And so our, our data for prior year projections is a little uh, mm -hmm. spotty, but I think we have. Right. And, and we implemented weighted student formula in 2013, right? Was for fiscal year 12. Fiscal year 12, okay. And school year? 12. So that would have been, yeah, 12, school 12, year 11-12. 11, 11-12, 12. 11, 12, okay. Um, uh, Councilor Sabi George. Thank you again. Um, the, the schools that are receiving, that, are, that will have declining budgets for next school mm -hmm. year, are any of them losing a portion of their nursing staff? I'm Nurses are paid for separately. I'm, I'm just, well, you're thinking about the overlap between. Yeah. I, what, so in terms of what we allocate out to schools, right, that decision is made by our health services team. Um, and so I could review if there were any changes that led to a reduction there. Mm -hmm. um, but the uh, like 95 percent of our nurses are allocated centrally. And so a change in enrollment uh, would not have a significant impact well, on that. with a declining school budget, oh. sometimes schools that have centrally right. funded a 0.5 nurse we'll bring may it up to full oh, time. Yep. make up for the rest of that nurse. So we I may can see check schools that, that on paper yep. right now have a full-time nurse, but that may may change in the new fiscal school year. I will double check that for you. So that, that would be helpful to know. And I think if we could even look at any school that's losing, again, this is related to my, my last yep. question around the I want to call them support services, but they're critical to our school of course, buildings. Of course. Whether it's the school nurse, certainly critical. A school librarian is critical. A community um, facilitator is critical. Right. Some, you know, all of the paras, but there is paras that play certain specific roles that are critical to our school. Yeah. So it would be important to understand the impact, especially of the schools with declining. Um, budgets, what the, the impact is going to look like in those schools. Sure. Um, 
And then can we talk, Council Redwoods talked a little bit about our students experiencing homelessness earlier. Can we talk a little bit about the, I, I recognize and appreciate that there's an increase in that funding, yeah. but there's also an increase in the number of students experiencing homelessness from the first time we talked about this yeah. um, in this setting in 2016. Uh, yes, and, and thank you for bringing that to our attention. Uh, and one of the, so the team that works with uh, the team in our uh, Opportunity Youth Office will be here on Monday and can answer mm -hmm. specific questions about what supports we're providing. From a, a finance perspective, one of the things um, that we did in the last budget cycle was we actually moved our homelessness investment into weighted student funding for this exact purpose. So it is now a dollar per pupil that is tied to the number of pupils. So for this year, that amount is up $170,000 uh, beyond what we had done in the school year 19, not because we increased the weight, but because there was an increase in the number of identified students. And so- So what is that dollar amount for the weight? So it's uh, $429 per student experiencing homelessness, and then another 429 if that student is above the fifth percentile in the school. Um, the total amount uh, last year was, uh, or for school year 19, the total amount allocated through that was 1.8 million. Um, it's now closer to two even, it's 1966. Um, and I believe it was 1.2 in the first year that we implemented yeah. it. So we're projecting, we're at 1.8 for this current school year, and for next fiscal year, we'll be at 1.96? Yeah, we'll be just shy of two. Yeah. It, I mean, it's, I want to say that that's great. It, it's great that we're doing that right. investment and that we're, we're, we've had that resource for our students. It's unfortunately, fortunate that we need it. Yes, um, agreed. So when, when we see an increase in the, the spending that we have on students experiencing homelessness, sure. we go over budget in our transportation budget. Where do those dollars shift from? Can we can you talk about where so this came up the other day? I wonder if we could think about it in a little bit more, talk about it in more detail. Where does that shift come from? Um, so we have um, frankly been a little lucky the last few years that we'd had transportation overruns in that we'd come in under in a couple of other areas. Um, our payroll tends to have, is, is I wanna say it's close to $800 million a year. And as you can imagine, very small fluctuations in our vacancy rate, like how long it takes people to fill jobs, can have million dollar effects on an $800 million payroll. And there's some noise in there. So we've come in slightly low on salaries and on benefits. We've also come on low versus our budget on utilities. And I think I mentioned snow removal, yeah. which isn't the biggest dollar amount, but everyone can relate to the fact that we didn't get as much snow this year. Yeah. And those, I think off the top of that's, my head, are the that, four the biggest, biggest. The biggest one. The have utilities have been pretty significant. Uh, with We've had a couple of warm winters in a row. Yeah. That put warm winters and cool springs right. together really save us money. Um, we've also come in under budget for our teachers in suitable professional capacity, which I can call out my OHC colleagues who are sitting right next to us for managing that so well. Um, in other years when we've had surprises in an area like transportation going over, if we aren't having some other things come in under, we implement spending and hiring freezes so that we can end the year in the black. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Councilor Edwards. Thank you. So I just wanted to make sure I was clear on the timing for when you're assessing the weighted student, the weights for the student yeah. formula. When does that happen? Or when do you add weights or subtract weights or? Uh, that would be, um, we're making initial uh, decisions and they go out to schools as proposed investments, usually in uh, the beginning of December. I think this year was December 10th. Um, but those increases or changes are subject to school committee approval. So we're sending an initial draft out to school leaders um, and it, it doesn't get final approval from school committee until the end of March. But the schools themselves see what we're proposing in the beginning of December. Do you, when you, when there are budget cuts in schools, do you track the impact? I know uh, my uh, colleague, um, Councilor Sabi George, had uh, noted that the, on morale and so on and so forth when staff is not there. But have you tracked the impact when your budget goes down for a school or drops maybe as, as large as this, $1.2 yeah. million in one school, how that impacts the attractiveness of that school 
going forward. I, I can, I would look at it and think there's a certain level of lack of investment in a school. Um, so if I'm choosing between the charter school, which is growing, right. and get, building a high school in East Boston, and a school that BPS is taking money from, me as a parent, I'm inclined to go to the other school, um, where there seems to be growth and excitement and continued movement. Um, the other thing, I, you know, I think you could look at other examples where there's increased funding or there's investment in a school and you can see that it compounds with excitement about the school and people are likely to donate to the school and so you have an Elliott that is incredibly successful. Um, and I bring that up because it's in my district. So I'm looking at two schools, uh, school tales of extremes. And so have you studied the impact of a loss of a million dollars on a school and how that actually how that impacts the attractiveness of that school, people wanting to go or be excited about that school over time? Yeah. I think we see a, a number of factors that contribute to a school's brand, and I know... Um, but I just want to focus on this one, right? And so on the loss of funds. And so one of the things we're doing with all of our schools, um, in particular those schools that are struggling the most with enrollment and funding, is identifying what are the things we can do to help them build their brand in the local community. Um, and we've seen some great um, successes there. Uh, uh, an example I know that will hit a little bit close to home for the council is the, the Perry School uh, in South Boston that was, was uh, struggling with enrollment for a number of years um, and uh, worked really collaboratively with the district to figure out um, what can we do to help build the enrollment uh, back up for the school and what is you know what, what are the factors that we're playing into that uh, lack of enrollment and the, the, so the Perry for a number of years was a sustainability mm -hmm. allocation school below 87.5 percent. So you have um, so when you see a de decline in enrollment and the wedding store formula then re re reduces the decline in investment from BPS then you are you go to the school and then help them try to build their enrollment again. It's, we're working with every school to figure out sort of what's behind the reduction in enrollment and help them figure out how they can improve it. Sometimes it is simple, uh, uh, more of a uh, reputation or brand issue. Other times there are sort of structural things about the way students are enrolling in the school that aren't working. And we work with the school then to figure out how can we help, because we can control those some of those structures, fix those structural issues uh, to help them improve their enrollment. So um, with regards, I guess, to East Boston, you know, sure. one of the things we were so proud about is that its graduation rate was going up. Yeah. Things were turning around in East Boston. Yes. And then it seems like it's just been capped at the knees uh, with this budget cut. It seems like just the, it did just the opposite. Right. Um, we were getting people to go and believe in the local high school and come there. So I think that I'd love to see a long-term study on how that happens. I mean, we, we, it was happening. The graduation rates were up at levels they've never seen before. Okay. Uh, that speaks to the turnaround of the principal and stuff. So I, I would love to see uh, how this is a school can bounce back um, from this or has bounced back. I'm sure. glad you brought up the Perry as an example. Um, the other uh, component, and we um, apparently you have the letter already that I haven't sent to you, uh, with regards to funding structures or potentially student population configuration that could help with that. And, um, we have the babies, apparently, in East Boston. We have the young folks in Charleston. We have the population. They're going to just other schools. They're not going to East Boston High School. They're going to uh, a growing charter school. So um, where we have now also a, a space issue, as you mentioned, in Charlestown, and the Edwards Middle School, which is slated to, we don't know close when, you have two populations or two schools that that I think benefit from a plan that the kids, 80% of the Edwards School are kids bust in from East Boston to have the seventh and eighth graders. So to turn East Boston High School into seven to 12 and stop busing those kids over to Charlestown. Then you have a space issue. I think you're compensating for the Warren Prescott um, for the modular high uh, space that you're spending extra money on for space. Now you have potentially an, uh, a facility that could, that already is educating students that could be potentially used by the Warren Prescott. So I guess when people come with this, because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply saddened, obviously, as you can see by these cuts. I'm disappointed, I'm sad. I, it's just something I cannot accept without some kind of solution, but council, we can do this by next year or so on and so forth. And the 2% is nice, it doesn't fix, right? 
So what's the plan? And by plan, I mean the dates, the times, not just that we look like to look into it. Apparently, it's, it can't happen this year. Was it even looked at for this year when you made the budget cuts? Just talk to me. Mm -hmm. How are we going to get out of this? Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of things. I think, you know, the East Boston is a neighborhood that we, um, of all of our neighborhoods in Boston, it's the, the neighborhood where we have the highest percentage of students in East Boston who are attending the Boston Public Schools. Mm -hmm. In addition, it's the highest percentage of students who are attending Boston Local. Public Schools in their own neighborhood, yeah. which means, um, you know, it's something like 70% of the students in East Boston are attending the Boston Public Schools in East Boston. So it is a, it is a truly a neighborhood um, where we are able to accommodate. And of course, the challenge, the we, two places where we see students traveling outside of the neighborhood are in high school where we have full choice and then in uh, the middle school, you mentioned the issue with the Edwards. Um, we, when we were, we rolled out the Build BPS plan um, in this fall and announced that we would begin the reconfiguration conversation with the McCormick. That was after um, you know, sort of months of us evaluating what moves were possible for us as a district and what changes we could make. At that time, we were not projecting as big of a decline, or we were not seeing as big of a decline in East Boston High School. Part of the reason that we're seeing such a significant decline this year is because this fall's enrollment was lower than we had anticipated. And then when we do the cohort work to look at how the school is going to be changing next year as a result of this year's enrollment, we're projecting an even bigger decline. It was at that point when we saw the large decline in high school enrollment in East Boston that, the, that we were able to have the conversation around possibly adding seventh and eighth grade to East Boston High School on a more aggressive timeline than we had talked about before. We're gonna begin the conversations with the community. We, you know, our learning from the McCormick reconfiguration is that even when we think we have a proposal um, that is, um, you know, well thought out, that the community needs time to hear it and process it. I think part of this is saying to the, giving the time to the Edwards community and the respect to the Edwards community to say, you know, this change is coming. What are the things that you need as a community to transition? Have the conversation with East Boston and Charlestown, um, both to figure out what's the right pairing. Can it solve the, cha the space challenges you mentioned at the Warren Prescott and Councillor Sybe George, what you've mentioned around the demand for um, schools in East Charlestown, um, excuse me, in Charlestown, now combine the two neighborhoods. Uh, in Charlestown, because we do think, you know, if we are able to add more elementary space that we would see more of these families staying. So there's a lot of reasons why we're motivated to make the conversation move. The first moves around K to six expansion right. outside of the middle school reconfigurations is the fall of 2020. All of the East Boston elementary schools have applied to become a K to six for that fall, as has mm -hmm. Harvard Kent, which is the only K to five in Charlestown, mm -hmm. have applied. Because of that, when we see that universal sort of appeal, um, we are um, evaluating whether or not we can move quickly to potentially do a, a more aggressive reconfiguration. But I will say, it's not just about the Edwards. Um, the Umana receives many students from the K to five, so they will be significantly impacted. The McKay receives some students from the other K to five, so they will be impacted. And so as part of this, I think we, we need to prepare for the Edwards community being concerned around the future of their school and the feeling of closure. We need to be prepared for the Umana community to feel like we're cutting them if we're taking away sixth grade capacity from them. We need to be prepared for the McKay community. These are not things that we can do quickly, even when we see the opportunity. These are things that we need to take time to deliberate on and be intentional. Um, in our conversations with the community, and quite honestly, as you can tell from the reaction we've gotten from Bill BPS this year, not a lot of faith and trust in us in terms of these conversations from years past, mm -hmm. and so we're trying to build up that trust um, and, and build up that community faith that we can do this with them, not to them. Um, and so I, I think the most specific I can be in terms of the conversation is, I think there will be some initial conversations. We've, we've been in conversations with all of the school leaders um, both in East Boston and Charlestown around these issues. Um, and not just in those two neighborhoods, but in many neighborhoods across the city. We will begin, we are continuing those conversations those spring. We are looking to start the public engagement, if not this spring, um, sometime in the fall, 
but those decisions at the earliest will be for that fall 2020 school year, if not 2021, just because it takes time for us to change enrollment patterns, notify families in time to, for them to make their choices, and make sure that we're not you know, missing any critical programmatic issues that go in it. So that was a, a long answer, but I think that's a, it's, a, it's a really important and complicated question that you asked. Just to, I'm, I'm literally summarizing. Okay. By as early as fall of 2020, if there's gonna be a grade configuration, for it would be the six grades, and that would be the earliest. That would be the earliest that okay. a change would be made. All right. Thanks. Councilor Sabi George. Um, thank you, Nate, for that. I think that, that response, especially about the building of the faith in, in those communities, because we, we know that that's a, a legitimate problem and concern that we face. But in the meantime, if we're foreseeing some changes with the K to six as making those sixes, we're foreseeing the potential of adding seven and eight to East Boston. Um, those are things that are generally being generally talked about, obviously here on the record, but also in community now, wouldn't it make sense then to hold those schools that will be impacted, East Boston High in particular, hold them um, harmless mm -hmm. with this cut because we're looking to rebuild them mm -hmm. pretty quickly in the next school year, or school year and a half. Yeah. And this, these large cuts can really crush that school and make that future transition much more difficult when we think about the impact on the community. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we, we have done that in situations. Um, we have a situation, um, Tech Boston Academy is a six through 12 in Dorchester. Um, they have seen declining enrollment in sixth grade, um, the middle school really. And so you see declining enrollment in sixth, seventh and eighth grade that has caused them to underweighted student funding, they would go through a budget cut. Um, they currently don't have any K to five schools that will feed them. Um, but two of the schools that feed Mildred Avenue um, can no longer feed Mildred Ave because of changes to feeder patterns there. And so we need to find new feeder patterns for the Kenny and the Taylor, in which we are going to propose and work with the communities around potentially changing the feeder patterns of those two schools to Tech Boston to make a K-12 pathway for those two school communities. So those are moves that we know are coming and because it, the, the change in feeder patterns we, uh, has to do with the rolling up of programs at Mildred Avenue. And so what we worked with the headmasters at uh, Tech Boston who flagged this issue and said, don't make me cut sixth, seventh, and eighth grade staff only two years later to start ramping it back up again because that doesn't make any sense. So what we did was they receive, and you can see this on our school allocations, they receive an allocation supplement um, equal to the anticipated enrollment increase that they're gonna get when the feeder pattern changes for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And that supplement will continue until that new feeder pattern enrolls. What makes East Boston different um, in terms of the, when we evaluate whether or not we should do a similar um, thing is, one, the, they're building a new program which would be for seventh and eighth graders. And um, I'm quoting some of the, the members of our academic team who said, we can't think about seventh and eighth graders as just smaller high schoolers. It's a different academic program, it's a different curriculum. They have different needs, both social, emotionally, and academically. And so the staff, the high school staff that East Boston is losing, isn't necessarily the right staff to add back if and when we add the seventh and eighth grade. The well, we don't know that. We're waiting for that information because it could be those community facilitators, it could be the paras, it could be the librarian services that seventh and eighth graders still need. And many of the staff at East Boston High, many of them, all of them are probably dual certified or triple, and many of them have five middle school certifications as well. Sure. The other piece that we don't know yet is if it will be adding a seventh and eighth grade and the school growing their own program like we did in New Mission, or if it will be a potential uh, merger opportunity with the, whether or not the staff at Edwards and the staff at East Boston would merge into a 712. And so we, you know, with the McCormick announcement, the original plan was the closure of the, the original announcement was a closure of, of McCormick. Now we've moved to a place where we're going through a facilitated conversation and a potential merger of two staffs and two school communities. There's a lot of collective bargaining impacts. There's a lot of, of working out of who and which positions will remain. And so if, if we, because we don't know all these factors, it could end up being that it's a completely different staff. The other thing is we don't know whether we'd be supplementing two, three, four years 
Um, so there's just so many un unknowns and because there's not a path forward. But with Bill BPS and the, the middle schools are the first that we're seeing this. When we make a determination that we are making a change and we've specified the timeline for that change, we are locking those schools in so that they are no longer subject to enrollment declines so that we can guarantee a consistent experience for the students in those schools. So what that means is now that we've announced the timeline for the McCormick, we do not plan to adjust their, a lot of their supplemental like non-core classroom staffing um, over the next few years as a way to adjust their budgets. We will be holding them harmless so that we can guarantee that consistent experience and that's something that we are um, planning to do with all of the Bill BPS announced timeline changes um, when we see it and when we announce a major change for a school community. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Edwards, do you have anything left? Um, I just wanted to follow up. Um, maybe we can do this again offline when we're discussing the, um, the weights. I really am interested in, in being able to have a robust conversation about the weights that you choose and what, not so much the dollar amounts, but, but what's all considered. I do think that displacement should be part of your weighted student fund formula, considering the scientific research that backs up the impact mm -hmm. is, is almost equal on the learning patterns for children who are, exper or children who are experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, so I look forward to potentially yeah. opening that up. I think it would help with the trust and the building, and I'm, I really do appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I, I also look forward to, uh, again, the sooner the better, to be able to say, okay, so this is going to happen uh, in between East Boston, Charlestown, and the Edwards, and all of these communities. So again, we can set up that offline conversation for how that works uh, to make sure. I, I, you know, I don't envy the amount of work that you have to do for a massive system. I just, I, I hope you understand my concerns are based off of looking at wonderful successes in my district, but also uh, struggling schools as well. And I'm, I'm really trying to make sure that they're all wonderful options for the parents I have. You could probably see us nodding. We agree. Yeah. Your, your concerns are noted and we'd yeah. be happy to follow up offline. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I adjourn the hearing, I have a few people that uh, may still be here that wish to testify publicly. Nina Gaeta, um, Ashley Figueroa, Sebastian Parra, and there's the uh, mic right there. Hi, I have Hi. Um, petitions and letters from parents and students. Great. And I just want to call to the attention that each signature represents a real human behind this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to address the BPS staff. Thank you very much. Um, you know, as a staff member at East Boston High School, I know how hard you work, but uh, there are three things that I need to say. Um, when we were cut as much as we were, $1.2 million, there is no such thing as a soft landing. Um, what happens to the teachers that you're recruiting right now when there are no students to teach? And we are an excellent school. Just wanted to say that, and you guys know that. So I'd like to say this. Um, thank you for your time. You have the petitions and the letters. Uh, I want you to know that while the students and the parents could not be here today, they are deeply invested in our students and our school. I come before you during this particular budget discussion to tell you that a budget-based formula on per-pupil enrollment is hurting our school. I am Nina Gaeta, and I'm the Family Center Coordinator for East Boston High School. We live in a community that is experiencing rapid gentrification, the impact of which is felt in our school. You know that our enrollment decreased by more than 200 students over 18 months, primarily because our families can no longer afford to live here. We lost over a million dollars and 12 teachers and staff because of that decline, especially staff who work with our special education population in the form of paraprofessionals and English language learners. So I ask, how does this help close any achievement gap? If the city has money, and based on the new initiatives it proposes, it does, why not just enrich the students who are still able to attend? Why can't money be restored to make sure classes are not maximized, not 31 students per class? Why can't we have that money to still offer our SAT and MCAS prep classes and keep the teachers who inspire others? Our school has made incredible progress across the board, and we want to continue that progress that we've made. 
So simply basing a budget on a formula is not looking at the human side of who's in that building, and it's the students who deserve more than being a number on a spreadsheet. We are also experiencing a loss, loss of students due to a lack of Boston Public School middle school seats in the community. Each year, an estimated 350 students have no middle school seats to choose from and must look outside of the community. That is not school choice. That is, there is no other choice. The BPS has plans to reconfigure schools into K to 6 and 7 through 12, which you just talked about. I can't tell you how excited we are that you might do it quicker than 2027. Um, it is because of this lack of middle school seats we're losing students to charter schools or the families are simply leaving and those families don't come back. And speaking for myself as a resident of the city, please look carefully at this budget and send it back. I implore the council to look at the reasons why student enrollment is declining. It is the development of luxury condos and housings on both a large and small scale. The cost of an apartment in East Boston is prohibitive for many of our parents. I had two lifelong East Boston residents, both of whom graduated from Eastie and now have children with us, tell me that they will try to hang on until their students graduate from our school, a place they love, and then they'll have to move out because it's too expensive for them. And that's a loss for us, it's a loss for the city. So I ask you, why aren't the lessons of gentrification in other areas of the city lost or not learned. Stability in housing means stability in our schools. So I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. Even before I say my name, I would also like to mention how you were talking based on numbers. I also want to mention that I'm gonna talk since uh, how I learned from Lydia Edwards a couple months ago. I want to talk from my experience. My name is Sebastian Parra, Sebastian Parra. I'm Colombian, I'm a East Boston student, I'm a senior. I'm also co-president with my friend Ashley Figueroa, here present. I'm also a fam family member, and I know what it is to be in a community. I know what it is to lost family. I, l I lose nearly 200 me family members last year in my school, and it hurts. I don't want it to be 215. I don't want to lose 15 more of my family members. East Boston High School is not losing members because it is a bad high school. And you can ask the interim um, superintendent, Laura Perillo, or, or as my friends will say, Laura Perille who said that myself and other four students from East Boston High School are ambassadors of Boston through art. East Boston High School is not losing students because of, it's a bad school. We're losing students because of gentrification. In this moment, we have a 10% increase of the cost of housing in East Boston just in one year. We know that diversity is one of the most important parts of being uh, in a community. East Boston High School is one of the uh, biggest diverse institutions of the city, and even Massachusetts. We know that it's important for the future. If not, as the two um, superintendent candidates for the BPS, Marie Izquierdo and Oscar Santos, who has Hispanic um, ethnicity. We lost nearly 15% of students in one year. And you ask, someone here ask, where, where, is, where are these students going? No one really answered that question. I have an answer. They are not going anywhere. Since the increase of housing, since the increase of cost of housing, they have to work. They are not going to school right now. They have to work so we can pay for that housing. I would like to know if anyone, anyone in this building doesn't have a high school diploma. I, f I believe we all have a high school diploma, at least I will at some point. But we need a high school diploma, we need education in order to succeed. You were talking about recruitment of uh, different and diverse teachers in the institutions. We do know who, who we're losing, we know the kind of staff we're losing. 
we are losing and the most affected uh, staff members are the English learners and teachers. Nearly 60,000 of the immigrants each year are 10 years or, or, or younger than that. If we want to have a seventh grade and we're losing the English learners, what's gonna happen with those 60,000 English learners students that doesn't have where to go because they don't have a, an actual high school to go to or a middle school? I want to believe that we all uh, agree in the fact that we are not just numbers. My school is not a school with 15% less of students. My school is not a school with 87% of students enrolled. We are the future, and I want to believe we all think the same. We're not losing money. We're losing opportunities right now. You have the facts that we are losing 200 students per year. In my hands, I have the facts that at least 500 students doesn't agree with this uh, budget cut in just two days. If you give me one year, I'll have the entire country. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to testify at this point? Okay. Hello. Um, good afternoon. Uh, before I present my argument, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, my name is Ashley Figueroa, and I am one of the co-presidents of our senior class at East Boston High School. I'm also president of our student council, and I was also captain of our indoor track team this past season. I've been involved in many student advocate activities, for example, the Boston Student Advisory Council, um, a council made up of student representatives from every public high school in our district. Um, so today I'm here because our school is expected to lose around $1 million in budget cuts. This is because our enrollment has gone down. Um, I do understand that enrollment is one of the biggest factors in budgeting, but we cannot do anything when our community is suffering from gentrification. Um, rent is going up, and unfortunately, that is pushing the low-income parents out of our community. And why is this bad for our students? Well, lowering our budget is going to limit the best education we can get. Um, for example, class sizes will have to increase over the years, and that's not good because statistically, it is proven that a lower class size betters our education for us because teachers are better to individually focus on us. Now, teachers. We'll be losing teachers. And um, personally, I came to East Boston High School my sophomore year, and I have never found any more motivating teachers than the ones I have now. Um, not only that, but cut, cutting these budgets will eventually let our programs be lost. And we currently has, have partnerships with College Advising Corps, PIC, um, Gear Up, Gear Up, so many programs. And our enrollment will only continue to decrease if we lower our budget cost. Why is this? Because unfortunately, we won't have enough money for these programs, for these classes. And the whole reason why students want to attend our high school is because of the opportunities we we offer in the programs we have. And let's mention that our standardized test scores will also start decreasing. Currently, we offer many SAT courses to take and MCAS prep courses in, on Saturdays, which is why our both of those SATs and MCAS scores have gone up quite a lot recently. Now, East Boston High School is very different from any other high school in BPS, in my opinion. We have strong administrative staff that has basically become a family to me. Now, instead of cutting the budget, let's find a way to better our community, to make it a better environment. You know, East Boston itself is changing. It's moving in people who can afford to pay rent, but moving out those who can't. How can our school's enrollment rate increase if our city is pushing students 
of poverty out. Now, BPS is one of the best districts nationally, but why should our educational resources be limited because of poverty? Instead of giving us a way out, help us guide us through this rough patch. I don't want my school that has changed my perspective on education, motivated me, and helped me become a better student to shut down in the future because of these budget costs. Now, the government solution to a problem is usually as bad as the problem. So what I'm trying to say is, don't only think about what's best for the district, think about best, what's best for the students. Thank you. Thank you. That, con I'm sorry. that concludes uh, this hearing on um, school budgets. I want to thank you for your time, testimony, and attention. This hearing is adjourned.